Hi, everyone. I have one o'clock on the dot on my computer. So I think I'll get started with some housekeeping notes before I hand things over to Ashley. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Carla Fall. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the fourth series in our project management series, project, Manage for, project management for libraries. Um, today, Ashley Alexander will be talking on project leadership. Um, your video and audio are turned off at the moment, um, and I would appreciate it if you could please keep them off during her presentation. If you have any questions, please use the chat to ask your questions, and uh, we'll answer your questions either in the session as it appropriate, or we'll wait until the end of the session for those questions. Um, we are recording this session, and I will make the recording available um, on our Minitex website afterwards as well uh, the slides for um, today's presentation as well. And I will email that out to you um, also. Um, in the email, I will also include a feedback link. Uh, and if you could please complete that feedback form for us, that would be very helpful. It really helps us shape our future um, webinars and uh, any other uh, project development or excuse me, professional development um, uh, sessions that we may put together. So with that, I will hand things over to Ashley. All right, thank you, Carla. Um, and thanks everyone for having me. I'm excited to be here today uh, again with you to talk about project leadership. So as Carla mentioned, my name is Ashley Alexander. I'm the Organization Development and Learning Associate at the University of Minnesota Libraries. Um, and just a, a brief background of me, um, I did not come from the libraries. I, I don't have a library's background. My background is actually in uh, organization development and learning and development. So um, I, the kinds of projects that I've worked on in the past and currently working on now are things around um, training and curriculum development, process improvement, um, strategic planning, things of that nature. But um, as always, and especially around project leadership, a lot of the concepts and ideas apply to all types of projects and all types of leadership. Um, I earned my prof um, excuse me, project management certificate through the College of Continuing and Professional Studies at the University of Minnesota. Highly recommend that program. And I know that um, for those who might be joining who are not local to the, to the Twin Cities, they have um, some online options available. Um, and just, uh, just so you know, I used to work for that program um, doing project management, um, leadership uh, development, things like that um, before coming to the University of Minnesota Library. So enough about me. Let's talk, uh, give a brief overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. So I'm going to be covering a lot of ground, um, kind of at a surface level. Leadership is a huge, expansive topic, and there are many aspects of effective leadership that we could talk about today. But I'm going to be covering leadership skills that are um, what I think are foundational. So we're going to be talking about, uh, to start out, what are the leadership skills for project managers? What are the stages of team development? And what are the leadership actions that can be taken at each uh, stage? What, uh, what are the effective ways for dealing with conflict? Delegating effectively, giving feedback. We're gonna talk about recognizing and rewarding the team and then wrapping up with how to influence without authority. So as we're covering these topics, listen and reflect on the areas you feel like you're pretty comfortable and areas that you want to improve. And we'll have some time at the end for questions, but you can feel free to put questions in the chat at any point. So let's start talking about the leadership skills for project managers. Uh, what you're seeing on this slide is the Project Management Institute Talent Triangle. And this represents the competencies for project managers. And competencies are the um, knowledge, skills, abilities, behaviors uh, in order to be successful. So this triangle has um, three kind of uh, sections of, of competencies, three kind of buckets, the technical and project management, strategic and business management. And then on the right side in the green is leadership. And this kind of covers all of the soft skills of project management. 
So um, these competencies include emotional intelligence, coaching and mentoring, influencing, negotiation, listening, problem solving, and team building. And emotional intelligence um, is a term you might have heard. It's the capacity to be aware of, control, and express your emotions and handle interpersonal relationships with empathy. And for this, self-awareness is really important. I would say for leadership in general, self-awareness is really important. You should know where your blind spots or discomforts are when leading. And then identify and incorporate tools, mental models, and input from others to help compensate for those areas that are most challenging. So next, let's talk about leadership styles. And there are a lot of different kind of frameworks for leadership out there, but often leadership styles kind of fall into two distinct areas, transactional leadership and transformational leadership. So transactional leadership is characterized by being more task-driven. Um, these leaders often lead by directing or dictating. They don't necessarily share or talk about the big picture. They typically exchange rewards for effort. They tend to be more reactionary. Uh, they tend to be more focused on the work instead of the team or team development. And they typically prescribe to a set way of doing things. Transformational leaders, on the other hand, create a clear and aspirational vision. They lead by example. They build trust and respect within the team. They communicate high expectations. They're typically proactive. They empower and develop their team and actually take effort to do that kind of work. And they're typically open to new ideas. So you can probably think of experiences with both transactional and transformational leaders in your own life. But in the chat, I'm gonna ask you to share some examples um, either in popular culture or um, people that you may think of when you think of the transformational leader. So we'll take a couple seconds. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Who would you say would be a transformational leader? Oprah, yes. Michael Scott, oh, that's an interesting one. President Obama, absolutely. Steve Rogers on the MCU, that would be Captain America. Yeah. Yeah, these are really good examples. Another one that I um, tend to think of are like Steve Jobs, um, Leslie Nope. Yes, I love, I love that. Leslie Nope definitely is a transformational leader. Um, and when you're thinking about the difference between transactional leaders and transformational leaders, it's important to note that no one person is completely one style over the other. The best leaders tend to blend the two and adapt to what the situation calls for. And they're responsive to what the team needs in the moment. So as a takeaway, think about some of the leaders in your life or kind of in popular culture that you admire and know which of these characteristics they exhibit on a regular basis. You can also use this as a guide for yourself and how you want to grow as a leader. So now we're gonna talk about stages of team development. So when we're talking about teams, the most common model referred to is Tuckman's five stages of team development. And you may have also heard of it as four stages of, of team development. But adjourning was kind of added on there, and this is an important stage for project teams that have a defined scope and a defined timeline. So let's talk about forming. At this point, the team is getting oriented towards the task. They're setting ground rules, they're testing boundaries, and they're establishing relationships with each other. So as a leader in this stage, you want to be mindful that you're clarifying goals, setting expectations, clarifying the roles and responsibilities for each person on the team, establishing those norms for communicating and resolving conflict. And then the next stage is the storming phase. So this one is characterized by having intergroup conflict. There uh, tends to be a lack of unity, um, people with different ideas that are kind of battling those ideas out. And there's often frustration and disagreement. So in this stage, as a leader, you want to be encouraging your team to share feelings by creating an open and honest environment. You want to redirect attention towards the goals, those kind of shared goals that everyone's working towards, mediate conflict using active listening, recognizing positive behavior, and demonstrate trust and transparency kind of by modeling that behavior. 
And then once you get through that kind of crazy storming phase, you get into the norming. This is where conflict is more managed. The group norms form and the team is becoming more cohesive and individuals feel more comfortable expressing their opinions in kind of a healthy and positive way. And as a leader, you're probably uh, reestablishing and, and setting those ground rules and expectations, maybe redefining goals and setting, setting the tone for giving and receiving feedback. And then from norming, you go into performing. This is where things are kind of working the way they should. People are committed to working towards the shared goals. Problems are solved creatively. Diverse ideas are welcomed. This is kind of when you hit the team flow. Um, and in this stage, as a leader, you'll be facilitating problem solving and decision making, giving feedback, encouraging your team to share successes. And then when the project wraps, when you're done, there's an adjourning phase. And it's important to, to kind of give this phase its due. So at this point, the team has completed its goal. Uh, they're recognizing the achievement, sharing learnings, and then the team disbands. And so as a leader, you can be mindful of holding a closing ritual, um, having the team recognize each other, doing your work to kind of recognize your team, encouraging your team to share the lessons learned, and then really celebrating their contributions. So at the, uh, at the forming stage, you're going to want to set some expectations. Expectations put everyone on even ground. Everyone, everyone knows where they are, what they're contributing, and what the standards for the group are. And it's really unfair to try and hold people accountable to expectations that were not made clear. Um, and you shouldn't be concerned about over communicating those expectations too. It may feel obvious to you because you've thought about it a lot, but typically people need to hear things a few times to fully remember them. So feel free to repeat yourself a few times throughout the process on what your expectations are. So as you're setting those clear expectations, which are really foundational for building trust and accountability, um, you want to think through and kind of talk through a few elements. You want to communicate to the to your team what is the expected time commitment in and outside of the meetings, and kind of what is you know what is the time commitment and what is the work commitment. What knowledge, skills, or abilities is each team member bringing to the role? So thinking about you know why are they there? What are they meant to contribute? What um, what experience or um, understanding are they bringing that is going to support the team? Uh, next, how should the team track work and give status updates? So is there an expectation that hours are tracked or that you're using tools like Trello or a spreadsheet to document work being done? And then finally, how and when will the team give and receive feedback, knowing that you'll want to have those opp opportunities for feedback throughout the process? So um, this happens typically in those um, in that forming stage, but you might need to revisit during the norming stage, and you might need to adjust some of the expectations based on what's actually working in practice. And I can share an example of this. Um, so for the strategic planning uh, team that I am currently uh, managing, there was an expectation that we were going to meet once a week. And we started that way, but realized quickly that that wasn't going to be enough time together to talk through the decisions that needed to be made. So we decided to up the meeting to uh, two meetings a week and then also hold space for small team meetings. So three meetings total. And this was something that kind of came out of some of that, a little bit of that storming phase when things kind of weren't working, things weren't meshing together. So then, um, Along with the expectations, you'll want to talk about the ground rules. These can also be called guiding principles, guiding values, but these are essentially the rules of engagement and they outline how the team is expected to work with each other. They're also helpful to refer back to in the storming phase when conflict arises. So some examples of ground rules that um, I've liked to use in the past is listen to each other with compassion and curiosity, assume positive intent, be mindful of what's yours to share. And I think this is especially true when you're um, talking about um, kind of information that you're gathering from others or um, thinking about what is confidential, what is, what is okay to share. Um, being present, asking for what you need, offering what you can, 
Um, if you're in a Zoom environment or a virtual environment, talking about whether cameras should be on, um, whether you should mute unless you're speaking, what are the rules for engagement in that virtual environment? Um, everyone contributes. Be mindful of how much you're contributing. So um, for those who might be contributing a lot, maybe thinking about pulling back and vice versa. And then silence equals agreement. And I think that one's kind of helpful when you've got um, some decisions um, that you need to make. And it's, it can be hard to know sometimes, especially I think in a virtual environment when people are um, withholding their opinion or when it's just everyone is in agreement. So that brings us to decision making. And here's, um, here's kind of a decision making matrix that you can use to describe how decisions are going to be made because you'll want to address that at the start as much as possible. So on this slide, you'll see that there are four boxes and there are kind of different elements. There's buy-in at the bottom, um, lower high, and then there's also risk, lower high. So there's um, the unilateral decision in the lower left box and that is the just do it decision. So this is characterized when there's low risk and low buy-in needed to move forward. Um, so an example might be, what should we name the project folder? This is something that um, there might be some precedent or it's just not gonna matter to a lot of people. So as the project manager, you may say, I'm just gonna make that decision. The caution here is to avoid extending the range of these decisions. And that could lead to bad decisions or not being mindful of when buy-in was actually needed. And then above that, in um, the upper left corner is the consultative decision-making. So this is when there is um, higher risk, but maybe lower buy-in needed. So this is where you would ask for input, but you would be responsible for making the decision. And an example might be, what is the best way to handle this technical problem? You might be needing expertise, but ultimately you're gonna be responsible for making that decision so that you can move forward. The caution here is that it can lead to factions or low support when more buy-in was actually needed. So then in the lower right corner, you have the majority decision, and that's where the majority in the group makes the decision. And you use this when risk is fairly low, but group buy-in is needed for successful implementation. So an example of this is something like, is it acceptable to move forward with this schedule? Um, the caution here is to avoid for more trivial decisions or when risk is high enough that you need to understand the alternatives. And then finally, there's consensus. So this is in the upper right corner. This is where you have high risk and you need high buy-in. This is where you have general agreement and support. So an example of this might be, what are the team's most important priorities? that might be something that you need to get a lot of input in and buy in on. And the risk is pretty high if you're not focusing on the right priorities. The caution here is that it is more time consuming. So you don't wanna use this for minor decisions or when an immediate decision is needed. So if you think back to a couple of weeks ago when we talked about project planning, you can refer to your RASIC uh, stakeholder matrix to help identify where you might need consensus and high buy-in and high input on some of the decisions that you need to make. So next we'll talk about dealing with conflict. And again, conflict kind of arises in that storming phase of the team. But conflict is normal and really necessary as part of any team. The goal is to be able to handle conflict effectively to perform and achieve results without damaging trust on the team. So this model um, that you're seeing on the slide here is the Thomas Kilman conflict model. It shows five different approaches to conflict or conflict modes. Um, and there's also an assessment that you can take to determine your default conflict style. So again, thinking to self-reflection, where are you most comfortable in dealing with conflict? So this model has, um, again, kind of two axes. There's the assertiveness, which is the extent to which the individual wants to satisfy their own concerns. And then there's cooperativeness on the bottom. And that's the extent to which individuals want to satisfy the other person's concerns. So, um, going from the bottom, you have avoiding. This is where there's low assertive and low cooperative. Um, and the conflict is typically not dealt with in that avoiding area. Um, so avoiding might take the form of diplomatically sidestepping an issue, 
postponing an issue until a better time, or simply withdrawing from a threatening situation. And one thing I'll say is that it's not necessarily that there's one um, mode that is more preferable than the other. It kind of depends on the situation. So you might actually want to use avoiding when the issue at hand is trivial or when the issue is emotionally charged and you might need to create some space and kind of back off from it for a while. Then next to that, going kind of up the cooperative um, axis is accommodating. So this is where you have more of a low assertive but high cooperative mode. So this is kind of a self-sacrifice approach. Accommodating might take the form of selfless generosity, charity, obeying another person's order when you prefer not to, yielding to another person's point of view. And this might come into play, it might be appropriate when the other party has maybe more expertise or a more effective solution, or when you need to preserve a relationship and the loss won't really be a problem that will impact the results of your project. And then in the middle, we have compromising. This is kind of a medium assertive, medium cooperation. And in compromising, the objective is to find some um, expedient, mutually acceptable solution that partially satisfies both parties. It can um, give, in, in compromising, you tend to give up more than competing, but less than accommodating. It addresses an issue more directly than avoiding, but doesn't explore it in as much depth as collaborating. So in some situations, compromising might mean splitting the difference between two positions, exchanging concessions, or seeking a quick middle ground solution. And this might be appropriate when you need a stopgap measure that satisfies everyone to move forward on something, but definitely wouldn't be appropriate when you need that more um, kind of collaborative approach. And then um, above that on the left side is competing. So this is uh, high assertive, low cooperative, and this is the power oriented mode. You'll use whatever power seems appropriate to win your own position, whether that's your ability to argue a point, your positional power, or your expertise. Competing means defending a position which you believe is correct um, and, or simply trying to win. So this might be appropriate when a decision needs to be made quickly or when there's an emergency. So thinking back to that decision matrix, when something needs to be done and it needs to be unilateral. Um, and then finally, there's collaborating, collaborating, high assertive and high cooperative. And this is an attempt to work with others to find some solution that fully satisfies everyone's concerns. Um, so this might take the form of exploring a dis disagreement to learn about each other's insights, finding a creative solution to an interpersonal problem. And this is appropriate when you have a complex challenge or when you need an innovative idea or diverse perspective, and when you have the time, because again, this is going to be the more time intensive approach. Um, so as a project manager, you may be called on to mediate conflict between team members. Um, so say you've been, uh, you assigned a task to a small team and someone isn't contributing. Approach those situations with curiosity and an open mind. Your role isn't to punish bad behavior, but to get at the root cause and try to correct it. And you can refer back to your expectations and ground rules to help you identify the gap between the behavior you're seeing and the behavior that you expect. Okay, so that's conflict. Next, we're gonna move into delegation. And we're gonna start out with a poll. So this is the opportunity for self-reflection. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. And what we're looking for is the reasons that you commonly avoid delegating tasks. So we'll take a couple seconds here. Hopefully you can see the poll. There are a couple options. Pick the one that is most common for you. We'll give about a minute here. All right, results are coming in. Okay. So just a few more seconds. We're seeing a clear leader among it would take longer to explain than if I just did it. 
Okay, so I'm going to end the poll. I will share the results. Okay, so let's see how it came out. Yeah, you can see 55%, it would take longer to explain. We've got a few people who feel they know that they can do it better. They don't want to upset their team by adding another thing to their plate. I can resonate with that. Um, I'm worried my team won't be able to get it done right. Um, some people know I'm actually really effective at delegating. Good for you. That is a skill. Um, and no one said my team will have questions that only I can answer. Okay. So let's go through these common barriers to delegation. So the first one is kind of that thought of omnipotence. That's the I can do it better myself. And at times this might be true. Um, however, as the project manager, you need to consider the value of having yourself performing the task or the opportunity cost and the opportunity cost of the lost time and maybe other things that you should be focusing on, like planning or organizing or developing um, your team. So as a project manager, if it's effective for you to do the, the task, then maybe you should. But if that's an opportunity for you to delegate and teach someone um, to do something new, uh, that would be something to consider. The second one is that fear of being disliked. Most project managers, whether or not they like to admit it, are concerned that their team members will dislike them or resent them if they pass along or delegate a lot of work, or if they pass along work that they feel like is not super satisfying. Um, that project manager risks burnout though, um, rather than inconvenience. So it is interesting uh, to think about here, team members generally rate a project manager who effectively delegates much higher than one who does not. The next one is lack of confidence in the team. So project managers who lack confidence in their staff um, should probably look to themselves for the answer. Is the team composed of people who have the right skills or is there something else going on here? Has the project manager maybe failed to provide the proper training, the proper expectations, proper information to support the staff and being able uh, to support the team and being able to accomplish what they need to? Um, and then there's the uh, expected to know it all. The team members expect answers from me. Um, and this is where sometimes project managers can have, uh, they can rationalize taking problem solving and decision making away from associates, uh, but up away from their team because they feel like they um, have all the answers. But when the project manager responds this way and doesn't give that opportunity, um, there's a real loss in, in the development of the team. And then finally, um, that feeling of urgency that I can do it faster than I can, can explain it. And I think this is really common um, because there is often a sense of urgency with the work that we're doing. But a project manager who really leans on this excuse to justify doing uh, a task that maybe he or she likes to do um, is, is kind of using internal resources poorly. So a little time up front to teach someone how to do something new will often save time in the long run. And it's important to note that sometimes project manager really can't delegate, but as people move up through an organization, take on more and more responsibility, it becomes more about delegating and less about doing. So a couple tips to think through as you're thinking about delegating. Focus on results, not methods. So rather than dictating how someone needs to do something, explain what are the results expected of them. And then collaborate. Ask the team for input on how to achieve the goals. This will help you get buy-in and some creative ideas that maybe you hadn't thought of. And then use delegation to build team capabilities. Again, thinking about that transformational leader who's really focused on empowering and developing their team. Delegation is a great way to build skills and knowledge and abilities on your team by giving them something new that maybe you've done that they haven't had a chance to do. Okay, so how to delegate. Here are four steps to delegation, a way to kind of plan it out. Start with preparation. Identify the tasks that need to be delegated define the results expected, and then consider the, the team members' abilities, interests, and workload. And then you'll move on to planning. This is where you'll explain the task and the results expected. 
talk about potential challenges, talk about the scope, and maybe kind of work through what are some ways around some of those potential challenges, and then establish the plan for follow-up. How are you going to check in with the team on the status of the task that you've delegated? And then you'll follow up. Check that the resources are available, discuss the progress, and offer encouragement and confidence. And then completion. This is where you'll accept the completed project product, but don't accept incomplete work. Um, that might be an opportunity to go back to the follow-up stage. Discuss the process and key learnings. What were some of the things that they did? What were some of the things that they learned? And then recognize and appreciate the work. So let's put this into an example. So um, Ritu is leading a team responsible for selecting and implementing a new cloud-based project management tool. The team has gathered the requirements and the next step is to research and document available solutions. So how might you delegate this task? Starting out with preparation, Ritu assigns each team member a solution to research. Each team member will report out on the price, the functionality, any missing requirements, and the accessibility standards. And then going into planning, Ritu will explain the task and where to document the information and how to document it. She recommends questions to ask sales reps on accessibility if they have to call a sales rep rather than looking at the website. Um, she explains that reports will be shared in two weeks and she will check in um, next week, um, on progress in the next week. And then there's follow-up. So at the next team meeting, Ritu asks how things are going. Is the team finding the information they need? If not, maybe she provides some guidance on how to get at the information that they need. And she acknowledges the information already gathered and how valuable it is, giving that encouragement. And then finally, completion. The team reports to each other on what they've learned about their assigned tools. Ritu thanks the team for their work in pulling the information together. We've got a lot of um, information that we've covered up to this point. I'm going to do a quick check in the chat and see if there are any questions before we move on to talking about feedback. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in. We'll just take a quick pause and breather here. So Carla asked the question, what if someone on the team is always disagreeing? Um, and we will talk about that in feedback, but that would be that would be a situation where you would need to be giving some feedback and um, and potentially pointing back to the uh, the team norms that you've established um, in order to kind of correct that a little bit. Could you provide a clear delineation between consensus and majority? Yeah, so majority would be um, if if most of the people on the team are in, in agreement. Um, I kind of think about if you were to put it to a vote, you might not get a unanimous vote, but you would get um, most everyone in agreement or at least the majority in agreement. Consensus would be you can't really move forward unless everybody is on board, you've kind of um, identified all the possible solutions, all the possible directions. You've really done your due diligence and getting a lot of input to make the decision. And then you work towards something that hopefully would have that unanimous vote that would have everybody in agreement. Now, it might not be a, re a realistic expectation to have everybody fully on board and excited, but at least having something that everybody can, um, can move forward with would be um, kind of the, the clear difference there. Good question. Have you led any or participated in projects with consent rather than consensus? Hmm. You know, that's a good question and I haven't really heard it framed that way. I think that there, um, you could kind of think about consensus as uh, consent again, not everybody might be totally excited about the direction, but in order to move forward, everyone has at least said, I am okay with this. Um, that would be kind of another way to think about consensus. So um, yeah, I, I haven't really thought about it in that way. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Well, we are gonna go ahead and move on to giving feedback. And again, we'll try and have some more question time at the end. 
but um, so project managers need to give positive and constructive feedback to the team throughout the project. And giving feedback, the good news is giving feedback is a skill built through practice. So if you aren't comfortable with it or good at it now, don't worry. It's something that you can work on and improve on. I know it's something that I have needed to work on and improve on in my uh, career. So giving feedback is especially important in the norming and performing phases of team development. And here's a model that you can use when you're giving feedback, um, and we'll kind of walk through the steps. The first is to describe the situation and the behavior. And when you're describing behavior, make sure to stick to what's observable and avoid making judgments. So behavior speaks to what you can see, what you can hear. Um, again, it's, it's that observable um, kind of situation. And then judgment is really an opinion or moral value that we interpret from a behavior or maybe assigned to a behavior. So behavior is something like you had your camera and mic off during the virtual meeting. A judgment would be you weren't paying attention. So then after you describe the situation and behavior again in that observable objective way, you express the impact or importance um, as, as it kind of relates to the behavior that you're seeing. Then you'll want to seek collaborative solutions. Um, and this is where you can kind of get buy-in and, and invite the person that you're getting feedback uh, to, to kind of work together to correct things moving forward. Um, and I think this is a really important step to uh, be able to kind of create psychological safety around it. Um, and then also get, um, get some ideas for how to move forward. And then you'll outline the consequences. This is where you explain how the solution that you've crafted together in the previous stage is going to affect the future. So that is a model that you use primarily for giving constructive feedback, for giving kind of the tough feedback. But giving positive feedback is really important too. And when you're giving positive feedback, you might just focus on the two elements, or the first two elements. So describe the situation and behavior, and then express the impact or importance. It's really important to give uh, this kind of feedback to let people know what's working, what, what kind of behavior results you wanna to continue to see. It might feel nice to hear something like, great job on that presentation. But it would be much more helpful to hear, you gave really useful examples that enhanced my understanding of the topic. That would lead the person who received that feedback to say, okay, good. I'll remember to include examples in future presentations. So again, let's put this into practice. Let's continue to use Ritu's example. Ritu gave, has to give feedback to Sarah after Sarah did not participate in the report out meeting on the project management tools that were researched. So in the describe phase, um, she might say, you didn't respond when it was your turn to report out at a meeting yesterday and didn't give any feedback to the rest of the team when they presented. You had your camera off and mute on the entire time. So again, she's not attributing any judgment here. She's just stating the situation and what she observed. And then she expresses, because you didn't participate in the discussion, we missed out on learning the tool you've researched and we'll have to extend the deadline to select a tool. So that describes the impact of the behavior that she saw. And then for seeking a solution, how can you get the information to the team in a timely manner? And then we too would work with Sarah and identify, okay, maybe sending it via email or following up in a different way so that they get the information they need. And then finally, outlining the consequences. That way we can select the tool without pushing the project timeline out by another week. So this would be an example of how you might use the desk model to give constructive feedback. Now say Ritu was gonna give positive feedback, what might that look like? Um, say she was gonna give feedback to Sammy. Sammy added some helpful input um, and items into the report that the team had not previously thought of. So um, you might say, Sammy, you added a lot of really great ideas and items to the report that we hadn't thought of before. And you shared that insight with the team so that they could add, their, add those into their report. Because of those items, we were able to give more complete recommendations to our leaders. So hopefully you can see how you can kind of tailor this model for giving uh, positive feedback as well. But um, this is, I think, a really great way to approach things in a really um, objective way um, and, and kind of modeling it so that you can be 
collaborative as well when crafting the solution. So preparing to give feedback, there's some work that needs to be done in preparation so that you can give feedback that is going to be um, heard. Constructive feedback that is not well thought out or delivered can have the opposite effect. Um, it can cause there to be a rift in a relationship, a feeling of loss of trust. Um, so there are some questions to think through before you deliver tough feedback. The first, um, is the feedback helpful? Is it something that is relevant to their future performance and something that they can actually take action on? So, for example, something that might not be relevant is um, something around, you know, I noticed a lot of vocal fry when you were giving that presentation. That would not be something that would be uh, impacting the performance um, in that presentation, and it's not really something actionable. It's sort of about who they are and how they speak. The second question, do I have all of the information? So are you making some judgments or filling in the gaps um, into a story that you're telling yourself about the person's performance? Essentially, are there other angles, other potential um, factors that might have led to the situation that you're referring to? Then is now a good time to, uh, for them to receive the feedback? Are they going to be in a place to hear the feedback and do something with it? Probably if they're running between meetings or, you know, having a child care issue, that would not be the best time to give someone uh, especially tough or constructive feedback. But the watch out here is to make sure that you aren't putting it off because you want to avoid potential conflict or you're just uncomfortable giving feedback in general. And the last question is, how will I create a safe environment for them to receive the feedback? Um, it's important that you have trust and that you convey that you are giving feedback from a caring place. So are there things that you can do to frame the feedback as an opportunity? Again, thinking about how you're going to collaborate to seek a solution. Are you giving that feedback with care and kindness? Um, and will you give them the opportunity to share their perspective as well? So is, are you going to approach it as a dialogue rather than um, just kind of dropping the information and walking away? So if you've established that you do need to give feedback and you've thought through how and when to give the feedback and you've outlined it using the death model, but you still find yourself a little bit hesitant to give the feedback, remember that giving helpful feedback from a place of love is a kindness, the way to show that you care about that person and their growth and development. So think about that transformational leader and maybe think about how they would give feedback, the, the leader that you really respect and kind of think through how they might go pro, uh, approach delivering that feedback. But another thing to consider here is implicit bias. So when delegating and giving feedback, check to make sure that you're implicit, check your implicit bias to make sure that you are promoting equity and inclusion and that you aren't um, potentially making judgments based on uh, biases that you hold. Um, and, you know, implicit bias is something that we all have. And when we're in leadership positions, it's easy for that bias to pop up because there's a lot of ambiguity and subjectivity when dealing with people. So here are a couple uh, common types of bias that you might um, want to be aware of. And the first is availability or recency bias. So this is when the most recent or most memorable moment kind of crowds out the rest of the information. So this bias kind of slants towards one or two big moments or the most recent experience rather than the overall performance and results that you're seeing from someone. And this can come into play if you have someone who is a little bit more bold or forthcoming about the work they're doing and their accomplishments. The next one is a halo and horn bias. So like an availability bias, this bias comes from a good or bad first impression. And we can let that kind of come before the whole picture of someone's performance or capability. So when you're delegating a task to someone, and maybe they didn't complete it on time, you might develop a kind of bad first impression, a horn bias, and might be reluctant to give them opportunities in the future. Next is confirmation bias. And this is when we're unknowingly focusing on the evidence that supports our worldview or our opinions, and then ignoring evidence that counters it. So pleasing generalizations like bad employees have disorganized deaths can come from confirmation bias, even if there is evidence that contradicts that belief. And then affinity bias. And this is essentially, we see people like us in a more positive light. 
uh, it seeps into how we judge their performance. We typically like people like us and we'll be attracted to people who have very similar work styles or backgrounds. And then finally, there's implicit stereotyping. So this relates to our preconceived notions about how about someone's performance based on racism, sexism, ableism, ageism, all other forms of ageism can come into play. There's been a lot of interesting discussion here that I've become more aware of around the ideas of professionalism and how those ideas can actually stem from white supremacy attitudes. And I'll just share um, that this is an area where I've had to grow and kind of think about my implicit bias as well. So the best way to combat implicit bias is to acknowledge that you have it and seek information that contradicts or disproves it. Okay. <clears throat> so now let's talk about recognition and rewards. Recognition and rewards are often talked about at the same time, but there's a subtle distinction. Recognition reinforces behavior you want to continue and rewards celebrate results achieved. So as a project manager, you'll want to think through how you're going to recognize and reward the team, recognizing throughout the project um, and rewarding at the end um, when there are significant milestones achieved, distinct deliverables completed, and then definitely at the end of the project. So recognition can take the form of regular feedback and encouragement, recognizing the team's work to their supervisors and leaders, acknowledging individual contributions in meetings, and then rewards can take the form of thank you cards, maybe a public thank you, kind of published in a newsletter or other um, kind of avenues, a uh, caribou or Starbucks gift card, taking the team out to lunch, you know, someday when we can do that again. And then if there's an opportunity for something like a staff award or an outstanding achievement award. Um, and again, thinking through how you're going to do that and then also how you're going to do that differently based on different people's preferences. Some people love to be um, recognized publicly, and some are more comfortable with a kind of one-on-one, -on -one more um, intimate kind of thank you. Okay, so last topic, we're gonna be talking a little bit about influencing without authority. So as a project manager, um, there are a lot of people to influence. You have the team, you have your key stakeholders, you have your project sponsor, you have colleagues who might have key resources that you need, and this may require persuasive appeals. So you can think about persuasion sort of in these three areas, the head, the heart, and the hand. So the head appeals to logic. It's bringing facts and figures, details that bolster your opinion. And people who are kind of, might be more scientific or, or appreciate kind of details and evidence um, would kind of fall into this category. The next, the heart really appeals to emotions. So you'll want to do, um, do some work to connect your ask to their values, to their beliefs, their sense of common uh, purpose, and you'll want to inspire with enthusiasm. And then finally, the hands. And this appeals to collaboration. So you want to approach people who um, appeal, who appreciate collaboration with uh, mutually important goals in mind. You want to seek their input, offer assistance, kind of show that you're working together. And <clears throat> excuse me, if you're speaking to someone you don't know or don't have a lot of experience with, maybe you're giving a presentation to garner support for your project, you might want to try and blend these elements. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Also, influencing without authority, when you're presenting information to people who might be above you in the org chart or have power over the resources of your project, think about that transformational leader approach. Talk about the vision, talk about the impact, and be proactive when issues arise. Okay, so we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, love to hear what are your questions. Or if you don't have any questions, is there anything that resonated? Okay. 
<clears throat> okay. Carla asked, how does persuasion play into influencing without authority? So <clears throat> persuasion is trying to get someone to kind of see your side. And when you're thinking about um, potentially having to persuade that something is important, that the project needs to be prioritized, that you need um, additional resources that might be taken away from something else. I think that's where persuasion comes into play. Um, so that's where you're kind of trying to, to influence the outcome, if you will. And um, especially influencing maybe leaders who are above you, who you need their buy, <clears throat> excuse me, buy-in to be able to move forward. <clears throat> okay. How can you oversee or not influence others if you have no authority over them? Or can you oversee others if you have no authority over them? So I guess it depends on what you mean by oversee. If you are thinking about the project manager role where you might not have positional authority over the team, but you are responsible for identifying the vision, kind of moving everything um, and everyone towards a common set of goals, um, that's where you really need to think about how you're influencing people because you don't have that positional authority over them. Um, so that's where you think about, you know, how are you going to motivate and inspire people to see the vision that you are kind of creating. <clears throat> Stacy says, I appreciate appreciated how the consequences weren't personal consequences, but how the plan will influence the project. Absolutely. Yep. Um, and often, you know, in that situation, you won't have uh, personal consequences to talk about, but I think it's more beneficial to think about what are the consequences maybe to the team, to the project, to the success of the of the effort. <clears throat> Martha asks, what tips do you have for working with volunteers or community members to set reasonable expectations regarding amount of time or work they will invest in the project? Really good question. So when we're thinking about um, those who might not have a kind of a monetary stake in the game, who might just be um, working on this because of their interest, I think that's when you, um, you know, think about how you're appealing to that, that desire to participate as a volunteer or as a community member. So um, thinking through what is that shared vision that you're creating and then engaging them in discussion about what are those reasonable expectations. So you might have a reasonable expectation for what's needed for the project and you want to kind of negotiate that with them and see if there may be opportunities to um, craft a, a joint uh, kind of vision for how they're going to engage, how much time they're going to invest. Um, yeah, so that, that you're kind of meeting them where they are and they're also meeting you where you are. <clears throat> Should all three be present from the last slide? head, heart, and hands when influencing without authority? You know, I think so, especially when you're talking to groups of people or people that you might not necessarily know what's going to appeal to them. But as you get to know someone, you might know, for example, that the project sponsor really likes to have a lot of facts and figures. So if you were to show up to a sponsor update and you didn't have that information, it probably would fall flat. So as you get to know the people that you're dealing with and what information they respond to, you can kind of tweak to emphasize one over the other. For those who want to learn more about team development and project leadership, do you have any favorite or go-to resources you can share? Um, <clears throat> so I would say uh, there is a project leadership course that uh, the College of Continuing and Professional Studies offers and um, has a lot of really great information. I would say as far as leadership in general, the Center for Creative Leadership, CCL, has a lot of really great articles and resources that I've personally looked to and learned from. Um, yeah, there, there are a ton out there. Um, another one, 
Corn Ferry um, has a lot of really great um, competencies around leadership, and they do some really good assessments um, in 360s. So if you were looking at what is your a particular leadership style, um, you can get a lot of um, good kind of personal reflection information. And then really, I mean, you know, you can do a lot of Googling. LinkedIn Learning has a lot of really great courses as well. Yeah, <clears throat> Corn Ferry Hay Group. It's kind of a funny name, but um, essentially they are kind of a consulting group that does a lot around leadership competencies. So good to know that the caption captured it correctly because that is exactly how it's spelled. <laughs> Other questions? And I will say too with resources, the bibliography has some articles and links in there that you can um, check out that helped inform this presentation too. Samantha says this presentation was packed with helpful, applicable info. No questions right now. I may need to rewatch and process. Yes, absolutely. Like I said, covering a lot at surface level. Glad it was helpful, though. And yeah, you might need to kind of reflect and, and think through, you know, what are the things that you really want to really want to focus on. Well, if you do have any other questions um, for Ashley, you can contact her. Uh, her email address is included in the first slide. I'll also include it in the follow-up email I will be sending out to you all. Um, thank you all for today, joining us today and your um, questions have been really helpful. Uh, I'll, you should get an email from me very soon with the recorded links and the slides. Have a great afternoon and a good weekend, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Carla. Yeah.